I am so impressed at how many people are still here. Honestly, when I found out I had to speak at 6 o'clock or 1800, I was like, everyone's going to bail for sure. But thank you all for being here. I am so excited to talk to you about Headless Architecture and the future of websites. Um, quickly, this is our agenda for today. A uh, quick introduction of who I am and why I'm here. Um, also, my experience as being a solution architect and the challenges that I've faced. Um, and then how I took the Hellas architecture approach to decouple systems and how that helped me solve a lot of those problems. And then also how to implement Hellas architecture. And if there's time, we'll do some questions. So, Dober Dan, uh, my name is Heidi. Um, as he said, I am an American from Portland, Oregon. I always feel like I have to apologize for that now, um, but that's a whole different talk. Uh, I'm a senior front-end engineer for a fintech startup called Bumped, and you can find me on CodePen and Twitter at the handle SwissWebMiss. Uh, but prior to my current position, I was a lead software engineer for a cre creative digital agency called Eroy. And Eroy worked with brands such as Nike and Taco Bell, but also smaller brands like a local coffee roasters and banks. And we did projects big and small from e-commerce solutions to email marketing. I mean, literally, if you had money and you're like, can you build me something, we would figure out how to do it. And something that Eroy um, you know, was really excited about is that we hyped ourselves up as being platform agnostic. And this is actually really nice from a client point of view because when you come to us, we're not gonna be like, yeah, we'll just make you a WordPress site. We would go through an extensive discovery, um, figure out and establish your technical requirements and then provide you a solution. But as an engineer, this can be super maddening because we have WordPress sites and Drupal sites and React sites and Magento sites, like every kind of system, we're supporting all these different sites because no two clients um, have the same problems that need to be solved. And so when we're looking at technical requirements for a client, um, they can range all over the board. One that I uh, just recently did um, was for an e-commerce platform, and they needed us to integrate into their order management system. But this order management system was very old. Um, it had no exposed API, and so it sent what's called EDI transmissions. And if you've ever heard of this, they're essentially like fax, yeah. It's not great, so it's like, okay, so we have to do that, all right, so that's gonna be a little bit of a challenge, sure. Um, and then we hired a bunch of new engineers um, that are really excited about React, and I love React, so this is not a diss on that. But they were like, please don't make us code in PHP. And I'm like, okay, I, I'll take it into consideration, thank you. Um, but we also talked to the client about what they want in the future to make sure that we can make this something scalable. And they wanted to create a progressive web app. And we're like, oh, that's kind of cool because React, that's short, okay, okay, cool, cool. But then talking to their ID department, they're like, well, we want to build a backend in Ruby. And I'm like, Ugh, okay. I'm like, I know Airbnb did this, so I'm, you know, it's possible. And it's, this is just a foundation that we're talking about, and now we're having to figure out what the site's actually going to do. And so, you know, one of the requirements that they had is that they wanted to include user-generated content. So what that means is that when their users post something on Instagram with their hashtag, they wanted to be able to use that content on their website, but not just like willy-nilly, they wanted to go through an approval process and all this. There's services that do this, sure, but then we have to figure out how to integrate it, or are we gonna make a custom solution? It's a lot to handle. So when we're going through all of these requirements, um, kind of like the original historic approach would be like, what system can we check the most boxes, right? So something that's encompassing all in one. But the problem is when you're trying to fit into parameters of a monolithic system, it has implications on scalability, performance, and user experience. So let's talk about technical debt, right? Um, let's say I find some kind of system that kind of checks most of those boxes. Once we start talking about scope and when we're gonna get this project done, um, it, oftentimes we can't get everything done in the right timeline, and so we start talking about an MVP, right? Minimal viable product. Like, what can we launch with? And then we start shoving all these other things into this phase two. But <laughs> phase two starts to get really, really massive and also super complicated, and so you kind of hope that phase two never happens and you can kind of just leave it off and then kind of be on your way, but it's a huge problem because you want to take these shortcuts to get things out on deadline. But when you're working with one system that you need to add all this custom code, phase two can be really problematic. In addition, when you're working with these monolithic systems, you're also tethered to their roadmap. So 
this probably will never happen, but if WordPress decided that they weren't going to be, you know, support WordPress anymore, and you have a bunch of sites in WordPress, now you're forced to have to, you know, add security patches and take on that code yourself, and that is like an insane amount of work. Um, in addition, whenever WordPress would have like an upgrade, you would have to make sure that you would do some robust testing before you push it live, because if you have custom layers of code, you don't know if it's going to break. And then also, and this is probably one of my biggest pain points, is that you have less control over that source code. So you're getting this monolithic system that already have these pre-built templates and themes they have to work with, and it's a lot of bloated code. And then also that code isn't accessible oftentimes. And so you're spending a lot of time up front making these templates accessible and more performant, um, which eats up a lot of time. And performance is extremely important. 85% of internet users expect the mobile version of the website to be faster than the desktop, which is totally fair, but man, that is hard to do. And it's really hard to do with monolithic systems because even if you ship something that's super performant, you now have content editors who are going in there and kind of messing everything up because they upload these really huge images, right, and all these additional scripts. And so then you're like, okay, okay, cool, cool, but let me go ahead and add this plugin that'll help com you know, compress your image, or let me add this caching plugin, but then those plugins are super resource intensive and called every time on page load, so now your front end has a really heavy load time, which you know, isn't going to cut it. And so if you're looking at this graph, and I apologize, I forgot to put um, the measurement on it, but uh, median time to interact for a lot of popular uh, content management systems, this is in milliseconds, so if you look at WordPress, it's almost 10 seconds for time to interact. I mean, that is completely unreasonable this day and age. So it's really complicated. Um, in addition, people are also expecting to learn more about a place that they are visiting through AR and VR. And what this tells us is that AR and VR is more likely not going to be just used for games and entertainment, but for regular content consumption. And that's really hard to do when you're working with a monolith system to think about how your content is going to translate to that environment. And 71% of millennials have said that they would not buy from a brand that published irrelevant, badly written, or poorly designed content. So this is a lot of work for content creators, right? You're, con you're creating content for a website, but then you also have to create content for your social, and then your email, and then maybe VR, AR, voice assistance. And when you're duplicating that content multiple times, there's going to be inconsistencies because you can't update it once and have it update everywhere. In addition, uh, the way that users interact with that content, that implicit and explicit behavior data, is stored in different databases. And so it's really complicated to make personalized experiences for them if you can't get access to that data. And so there is a different way to do this. And what that is is headless, what's called headless architecture, which is decoupling of the systems. And so what that means is you separate the presentation or the front end layer from the back end layer where all the content and data is stored. So here's a way to visualize it. Um, basically, your web server and database is part of the um, main infrastructure. You also have a back end UI or dashboard where people can add content. And then you have a series of APIs that can send that data out to multiple different channels. And then you can see here that your code or the presentation layer of the front end is actually separate from that and hosted on a separate web server. So you can port it to uh, your browser or any other device. Whereas a monolith system, everything is encompassed in one giant chunk. So your presentation code is connected to your backend UI, and there is no exposed APIs, and so it's really hard to port that data to other channels. So when we're talking about APIs, there's a lot of different varieties, right? So if you're looking at a sample e-commerce architecture, you have your experience APIs, so that's content management. Um, process APIs, which is like your payment processing, shipping status, and then your system APIs where a lot of data is stored and but can be uh, queried and mutated. So that's your you know, payment information, customer information, inventory, and so on. And there's a lot of positives with going this direction, uh, one being flexibility, because it allows each team member to focus on what they're good at. And so your content creators can co create content models, your front end engineers can focus on whatever framework they would like to use for their front end, and your back end engineers can set up the data architecture that supports the content. And because it's framework agnostic, it's super awesome because your back end and front end are swappable. So, quick little side note. I love React. I'm just, I was a PHP developer for a really long time. I'm really obsessed with React. But really think Vue looks pretty good too. So I like to know that in a year or two, I can swap my systems and I don't have to just start from scratch. 
In addition, um, you can have a lot faster page speed. A really popular pattern is to actually use static site generators like Jekyll or Gatsby to actually render the front end code, which makes it a hell of a lot faster, but also a lot more secure. Um, you also have greater control of the information you're querying, um, so you can only query the services you need when you need them, instead of having everything be loaded at the same time. You can also test and iterate components separately, which is really nice, and so when you need to ship a new feature, you don't have to ship the entire code base, you can just ship the code that you've changed. In addition, uh, it's omni-channel. I mean, it's really create content once and port it everywhere. And so let's say you worked for an airline, um, Kayla. And so you can create a flight manifest once in your database. And then as a user, I'm you know, searching for a flight to Zagreb. So I'm on their website, like looking for a site for Zagreb, and I sign up for an alert when the price drops. And then my Alexa tells me, hey, there's a price drop on this flight, would you like to purchase? And I'm like, great, obviously would. And then, you know, a couple days beforehand, I get an email on my mobile device that says, check in for your flight. And so I check in. And then I'm at the airport, and I'm debating, should I you know, use the bathroom real quick or not? And I get a push notification on my watch that says, your plane is now boarding. And all of this information is possible because the data is updated in one place. If it was updated in all these different places, you could give the wrong information to the user. Also, something that Americans are terrible at, um, but I know Europeans are a lot better, is localization. Um, it's oftentimes people avoid that because it's, um, it looks like they're kind of duplicating work, right? But when you're working with uh, headless architecture, you can create a data schema that has a meta tag that says what language you'd like to serve up, and it's a lot simpler to send that information out. But it's not all rainbows and sunshines. Obviously, I have to tell you the bad parts, otherwise I'd be a bad person. So, well, you do get further reach. Um, it also means that you get a restricted editor. So what that means is that for the people who are creating content for your sites, they're not going to have that fancy, robust dashboard that they're used to. Um, they also likely won't have a WYSIWYG editor, and that means what you see is what you get, so you know, they can add those inline styles. Um, they'll probably have to deal with something like Markdown or just text fields. And there's no built-in plugins, and so they won't be able to just add stuff willy-nilly. They'll have to have an engineer be able to ship that feature for them. In addition, while it is scalable, you now have to deal with a larger tech stack. So that can mean a lot of increased maintenance. And so, you know, what if your front end, your back end is using different technologies? It's not likely you have one engineer who could do both, and so you're probably gonna have to have more resources. Also, the code is in separate web servers or containers, and so that's something you're gonna also have to update. And then also version control is something you're gonna have to be mindful of. Lastly, while it is a lot more performant and a lot faster, these kind of architecture can be a lot costlier. And the reason is is because there's no open source code base you can just download and use. Usually what's going to happen is you're gonna use a subscription-based API service, which you're paying monthly or yearly for. And just as a word of advice, a lot of times they'll start you off with a really affordable plan, and then a year later they up the price to an extreme amount, and it's just, and you're already kind of stuck, and they know that. Um, also you have additional hosting for a presentation layer, so that's additional pricing. But let's say, you know, now you know all the bad things that could happen, but you're still down, right? So it's really important that you start to kind of decouple your mind um, when you take this approach and start to think content first. And so what that means is you need to start with what you want to say instead of how you want to present it. Um, so first thing to do, think like a content strategist. If you have one um, as a resource, use them and collaborate with them. Um, these are the kind of questions that you want to start to ask yourself to kind of start to understand what kind of content you want to create. Uh, who is my audience? What is their customer journey? And what content do they need in each step? Think about that KLM diagram, right? Uh, what channels do we need to communicate through and what, how do I structure the content? And that's really when the database architecture starts to come in. Two, brick break the WYSIWYG addiction. It's, it's, this is really complicated. This is one of the hardest things I've had to talk to with clients because they're so used to being able to control the presentation of their content. But you really need to let them know like, hey, if we don't have this WYSIWYG, then all your content is going to have consistent patterns because you're not ruining it with all your inline styling. 
But the biggest problem that they've approached and where I'm like, okay, that's kind of legit, is that they aren't able to preview their content before it's published. And that is, you know, that's legit. So what you can do is you can add metadata for content status, right? So you can have draft, so if they're still kind of working on something, or you can have them save to preview or to publish. And if they saved a preview, you can actually have that as part of the payload to then um, send to a staging site. So they can actually see it live before they hit publish. Once they hit publish and save it, then it can go to the live site. So this seems to be a really good workaround that kind of makes everybody on the same page. And third, use APIs instead of plugins. It might be tempting just to use some kind of integration that kind of comes out of the box, but you've already come this far. You don't need to do the plugin thing anymore. And the reason I say that is because you don't want to get locked into these vendor relationships. You want to be able to have this flexibility that you've worked so hard for. But when you're vetting APIs, you need to make sure you look at these things. So data architecture, do they have all the fields that you need to store? Uh, what's the type of API? Is it a REST API? Is it a SOAP API? Do they have language bindings like you know, JavaScript or Perl or whatever you would like to code in? Um, also check their average downtime and availability because you don't have any control over that. Um, also requests limits and cost. Um, it might, the price point might look really nice, but if you notice that you're gonna need to make more requests than that price point, the cost could go up. And also documentation and support. Check out their forums, are people angry? If they're angry, just don't, don't bother with that API. However, I don't think a lot of us in this room are gonna go into work on Monday and be like, well, I can start from scratch, this is great. Like, we all work with legacy systems or we've inherited legacy systems that we kinda have to deal with. But there's hope. Um, there's this approach called the strangler pattern. And what this is, is a um, software engineer named Martin Fowler was in the woods in Australia and he saw these strangler fig trees. And the way that they work is they have these crazy upper branches where vines grow off and then they grow down into the roots of the tree and kind of strangle and take over until the tree is completely taken over with new growth. And it's funny because Martin was like, hey, that's kind of a cool approach to software, which you know is kind of random, but it makes a lot of sense, right? It's like take a little tiny piece and update it and keep doing that until the entire software or website or whatever is completely updated. And so kind of some tips on how to do this is plan. Plan and analyze your code base and understand the relationships between your content because then you can identify the boundaries, right? You can understand the dependencies on if this component needs this component to operate. And then once you identify the smallest component that you can update, start there. And also refactor both the back end and the front end at the same time. It won't do you any good if you're just refactoring the back end and you're still trying to fit into that front end monolith system. Things not to do is refactor page by page. I mean, sure, this is all pretty much common sense to all of us now, but a page has so many different dependencies. You can't just update your about page and expect that it's going to be easy. Um, also, make sure that you're mindful of scope creep. Once people get the idea that you're updating something, they're gonna have some opinions about what you should update. Like, oh, you know, I would really like to see a new contact form, or ooh, can we do a new navigation pattern? And it's just start small, and you'll get there. And so long-term process, basically, you find the microservices that you want to adopt. Um, you create a parallel um, system that can coexist until you test and iterate to make sure that it's solid, and then you sunset your old code. And so just to wrap it up and put a little pretty bow on it, uh, headless architecture can provide a more scalable, performant, and personalized approach to your web applications and beyond. Do we have any questions? Otherwise, here's this thing. Yep, please rate all the talks on Joined In. I think yep. I forgot to say that today. Um, it's a great way for our speakers to get feedback and improve, and it gives you an excuse to finally scan a QR code <laughs> other than setting up you know, Google authentication. So, yeah. um, questions, right. who has questions about this? That was a lot to take in. Yeah, sorry, I, really I it, sped through that. It's yeah, late. it was I great. You finished right on the money, too. Perfect. So was... I saw that sign come up, and I was like, yeah. all right, here we go. All Question right. in the front here from Luca. Hi. Hi. Uh, that's a cool talk. Um, Thank you. Do you have any tips for selling this when you're dealing with greenfield development? Uh, when traditionally you would have, like, the web dev team doing the web, and here you have to develop two code bases in parallel, 
do you immediately go and split it into separate teams? So one team works on the back end and API, the other team works on the front end, or do you do like both? Because you're planning for all of these other channels, you're not necessarily implementing them straight away. So yep. any, any, any tips and experience yeah, around that? Yeah, absolutely. While they can work in silos, I think at the beginning they have to plan all this together, right? Even like content has to talk to the database architecture and the front end has to understand how the content needs to be presented. There's a lot of collaboration up front, but to your point, they can work in different um, trajectories, right? And so that's kind of, that can be really helpful, but mostly the biggest pro to it is that they don't have to be tethered to the same framework but they will be kind of getting to the same goal. So I do think you'd still want to hire the same um, and make sure that they're collaborating at the beginning, but then um, allow them to kind of work separately to get to their own goals. Hope that helps. Other questions? I have one. Okay. Um, how does this impact cost or time to market? Do you see a, a big increase or is it roughly the same? It's, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, in the couple times that we've done it, it has seemed to be a little bit more costly and it does seem to be more of a rolling timeline. So you do have like this MVP phase two approach, but the technical debt is a lot less because it's very small steps that you're doing because you can ship features really simply and you don't have to wait for another big push. Um, but it depends on the type of headless architecture that you find. Maybe the microservices are really affordable. Um, the e-commerce solution that we just did was a little bit costly, but it made sense to be able to check all the boxes. Great, any other questions? Hi. Hi. Uh, great presentation. Uh, so we, we've done a couple of headless, uh, headless dynamic apps slash website, uh -huh. and we had a lot of issues with uh, with URLs and SEO. So making a headless headless uh, website is really sometimes complex in terms of rebuilding the whole SEO stack that you get from WordPress or any other CMS. Yes. So how do you handle those situations? Yep, that's a really good point. I was I was you know tempting to like put a lot of that in here, but I think there's ways that you can create your content models that actually help a lot with that SEO. Um, also using static site generators can help a lot with that as well. Um, but it is one of those things that you have to kind of uh, worry about as you're, um, as you're going along. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. <laughs>